Joseph Smith, founder of the Mormon Church, was a brainwashing occultist, a pathological liar, an unrepentant charlatan, an aspiring dictator, a thief, a bum, a racist, a sexist, a plagiarist, a mystic, a mason, a pederast, a polygamist, a con artist, a convict, a fraud, a thug, a smoker, a drinker, a terrorist, a traitor, a theocrat, and a thoroughly despicable bigot. But was he a murderer? Well, we're going to tackle that question and several others tonight in the exciting conclusion of the Carthage Jailhouse Shootout. And joining us once again this week to finish the twisted tale is Bryce Blankenagle of the Naked Mormonism podcast. Bryce, welcome back. Thank you for having me once again, Noah. So, now, when we last left our anti-hero, he was trapped and hopelessly outgunned. Uh, if everyone recalls, of course, somehow, despite being locked in a jail, he's armed with a six-shooter, and he'd been drinking all day. Shot rings out from the angry mob below, and the jail guards abandoned them. And on that dramatic note, I'm going to hand the narrative back to you, sir. Sounds good to me. Thank you very much. So, we have the four gentlemen, Joseph Smith, uh, Hiram Smith, his older brother, William Richards, and John Taylor. So when the mob runs up the door after firing their warning shots, um, all four of these guys ran to the door to try and hold their shoulders against it to, you know, block the intruders or, you know, at least impede their progress a little bit. So one musket ball smashed through the latch on the door, um, probably because the mob thought that the door was locked. Um, so at this, of course, this freaked all the guys out, and um, the three – Joe, uh, William Richards, and John Taylor continued holding their shoulder against the door, but Hiram, Joe's older brother, ended up kind of backing away from the door while still facing it because I presume he was freaked out. He was had the adrenaline pump, and he was about to get killed. Right. So what ended up happening was one more, the second ball smashed through the center of the door, and it struck true. And this hit Hiram just underneath his left eye and embedded in the back of his skull. Another ball smashed through the, the window from outside from the mob that had gathered outside of their window and struck Hiram on his left flank, which tore all the way through his body and hit his pocket watch in his breast pocket, shattering it into a thousand pieces. He fell backwards to the floor, exclaiming, quote, I am a dead man, end quote, and laid on the floor profusely bleeding. His bloodstains remain on the floor of the jail to this day. All right, one down, three to go. Right, so nearing death at this point, another ball crashed through the door and grazed Hiram's chest and embedded into his head through the bottom of his throat. Surely dead and motionless by this point, a final subsequent ball lodged into his left leg. The three remaining men were in a shower of musket balls. Many of them were lodging in the ceiling above their heads, being fired from the window or from the mob that was lower down on the stairs. So seeing this happen, Joe ran over to his brother Hiram and crouched near his lifeless body and said, quote, Oh dear brother Hiram, end quote. Knowing, of course, that Hiram was dead or soon would be, Joe stoically stood up, and strode over to the door that was being pushed open by the mob. He pulled out the six-shooter from his pocket and shoved the muzzle of the pistol out the small opening in the door. He snapped off all six chambers, but of course, unluckily, three of them misfired. The three balls that were fired into the mass of bodies in the narrow stairwell struck flesh, killing two men and wounding another man. Okay, now, I, I know that the Mormon apologists hotly dispute the claim that he actually killed anybody, I, even though they freely admit that he fired a gun into a crowd of people hoping to kill some of them. So how do we know what we know uh, on this subject? How do we know what happened to these guys? Well, it's kind of tough to tell because we have to take it from a couple of different sources. But what I would like to do is pull another quote from History of the Church. And when I say History of the Church, this is the the church published history that they themselves have recorded and published. So this was recorded in History of the Church, Volume 7, page 102. This was John Taylor's recounting of the situation. Quote, He, meaning Joseph, however, instantly rose, and with a firm, quick step and a determined expression of countenance, approached the door, and pulling the six-shooter left by Brother Wheelock from his pocket, opened the door slightly, and snapped the pistol six successive times. Only three of the barrels, however, were discharged. I afterwards understood that two or three were wounded by these discharges, two of whom, I am informed, died. So that was 
John Taylor, an eyewitness and the third prophet of the church. Well, now if he Mormon been, apologists want to... I'm, I'm sorry, now, he would have been, uh, just to play devil's advocate, he would have been a witness to the events, but not to the death of those three men. So he is just recounting what he heard secondhand in that, in that part, right? That is true. However, he also became the third prophet of the church, and it is stated by the church itself that anything that is written by the hand of a prophet is considered to be revelation divinely revealed from God, and therefore scripture and irrefutable. All so, right, well, there you go. Use their own weapons against them. Yeah, and that's what the what's so <laughs> easy and great about the history of the church is you can anything that I talk about in my show or that we're talking about here today is all recounted in their own history. Right. They can't really dispute it if they themselves are the ones that recorded it. Yeah, it would be nice so, if we had, like, Jesus' arrest records. I mean, assuming that Jesus existed. But it would be so nice if we had those kind of historical records like we have for the Mormons. My guess is if there is such a dude, he wouldn't look much better than Joseph Smith. I'm, be, I'm willing to agree that you're probably right. I mean, because when you hear the Mormons tell this story, the, you know, Joseph Smith is a martyr that willingly goes to the jail knowing that he's going to be butchered. That, that, does, that kind of conflicts with the idea of a guy standing at the door and firing three shots down trying to kill the, as many people as he can before they come in and shoot him. You know, not exactly yeah. what they said. But, but I, I imagine that's probably what really happened with Jesus. You know, whacked a dude's ear off and then they said, oh, you know, we'll tell him later that you put the ear back on or something. <laughs> and I mean, honestly, how often do martyrs actually shoot back? Right. I mean, if, if that's kind of messes up the ideal of what a martyr actually is. Somewhat contradictory. The, the willingly is a big part of it. Okay, so so Joe has just fired his gun into the stairwell. If we believe common sense, he fires three times into a crowded stairwell, probably killed somebody. But if we believe the Mormon account, he's got all the aim of an imperial stormtrooper. Hiram's bleeding out on the ground. Now, wh wh there were two other guys, and they were armed. You said with canes. <laughs> That's right. So actually, Joe firing his rounds into the crowd caused a momentary uh, second for the mob to recoil. Mm -hmm. So uh, before Joe had emptied the gun into the mass, Richards and Taylor had just been using their canes to hit the hands and the guns that were poking through the slightly open door. They were just trying to move the guns and deflect the shots. Right. But you know, this was inevitably a useless effort. And I love the fact that one of these dudes is hugely fat. I'm sorry, because you know, I know Mormons just look like, you know, people of the 1840s, back in the 1840s, but I'm imagining two Mormon missionaries in white tee, or the white button down with the short sleeves and the black, and, and like hitting, you know, guns with the canes and one of them weighing, it's, it's looking like a deleted scene from, uh, uh, the Book of Mormon musical. <laughs> I like it. We should uh, we should petition Matt and Trace. Yeah, they'll, uh, so they'll that do a little there. sequel there, yeah, or a prequel, I guess. This yeah, would be. for sure. <laughs> yeah, well, very early prequel. So the next victim of this mob was actually John Taylor, who we talked about was the third prophet of the church. Mm -hmm. So he had been wildly swinging his cane at the barrels and the bayonets that were, you know, discharging in the room. And once he realized that resistance was futile, he took advantage of this momentary slowing of gunshots that were entering the, entering the room. And, of course, he left his post at the door and sprang for the open window. Just as he left his post, there was a ball that was fired from the stairway that crushed through his left thigh that shattered his femur bone. This caused him, in his own words, to lose all control of motor functions to that leg, and he collapsed on the floor right in front of the window, unable to jump out, yet visible to the mob that was outside. Then there was a ball that was fired from the mob outside that hit Taylor in the chest, that actually ended up striking his pocket watch in his breast pocket and froze the hands at 5, 16, 20, and 26 seconds p.m. This is just some slow motion and a few doves away from a John Woo flick. I love it. Okay. <laughs> right? So this would have been a kill shot. Mm -hmm. But the watch luckily diffused the majority of the ball's energy, and this momentarily saved Taylor's life. And, of course, the energy from the ball threw him back into the room away from the window. So he collapsed. He was collapsed on the floor, and two more balls, presumably fired from the stairwell, entered his leg below the left knee, and then one entered his arm, shattering his left wrist and embedding into the fleshy part of his left hand. So he rolled underneath the bed with four musket balls inside of him. While he remained under the bed, he was shot once more, and this ball... This, it's kind of graphic how he recounts it, but it passed through his left hip and ripped a large chunk of flesh, quote, the size of my hand, end quote, off of his hip bone. 
And so he's bleeding everywhere. So let's put a pin in that, and we'll come back to John Taylor in a minute, because now we got to talk about the star of the show, Joseph Smith. So Joe had snapped off the three shots from his pistol, and he too realized that resistance was futile. He understood that nobody in the room would see the sun go down that fateful evening. So with Hiram unconscious and bleeding out on the floor, and Taylor getting shot into human Swiss cheese, Joe decided to make a run for the window, just like Taylor had tried seconds earlier. Joe, almost in slow motion, I'm sure at this point, dropped the pistol and turned around and ran to the window. So at this point, nobody was trying to hold the door closed. There was Willard Richards, but we'll get to him in a minute. Yeah, I was going to say, wait a minute, the there's mob... a 350-pound guy. What do you mean here? <laughs> we'll get to him. Don't worry. All right, all right. So the mob entered the room, and they took aim at the fleeing Joe. Joe got to the window and stood with both hands raised to the square on both sides of his head and yelled, quote, Oh, Lord, my God. Right at that point, two balls from the mob in the room entered his back and two from outside entered his chest. Joe collapsed and fell from the second story window onto the ground in front of the mob. He was dead and laid motionless on the ground outside Carthage jail, slain by a painted black face, faceless mob. So let's cut back to the jail cell. Once Joe fell out of the window, the mob inside realized it and they ran down the stairs to make sure that their job was done. Of course, leaving Willard Richards and human sieve John Taylor in the room alone. The 350 pound mass of human shield Willard Richards was the only man in the room that day to leave without a single bullet hitting him. No shit. Right. Amazing, right? Somehow, the other three men in the room were shot to a point that they were scarcely recognizable as the men that they once were. But the ultimate fat ass in the room didn't even get a hole in his jacket from a stray. Well, now, that's the only positive thing that we can say about Joseph Smith so far, is that at least he wasn't immoral, to just, uh, immoral enough to just climb behind the fat guy. The only <laughs> I'm trying to find something nice to say about the guy in this story. I mean, he does die by the end of it. Yeah, so. <laughs> Uh, yeah, fair enough. Uh, he he was a martyr. We can say well, that about him. That's, well, I, that's I, don't, I don't know if we can say that anymore either. All right, so the fat guy is, a, is is trying to make a break for it. I can only imagine how he's huffing and puffing. So, yeah, he was afraid that the mob was going to come back and finish the job. Mm -hmm. So he tried to leave, and Taylor, that was, who was still bleeding under the bed, heard him attempt to leave the room and said, Wait, take me with you, of course. So Richards went to the room next door that was the like the solitary confinement holding cell, mm -hmm. and he opened up the door, and then he came back into the main room and picked up Taylor from underneath the bed and dragged him into the dungeon cell. So he ended up covering him with an old mattress to try and hide him from a mob. Richards was convinced that he was going to die at this point, and he was hoping that at least Taylor would be alive to tell his tale. So he stood by the door at after that point, and he just expected the, re the mob to return and execute both of them. But the cry was soon issued that the Mormons are coming, meaning the Nauvoo Legion and the mob just disbanded. Everybody fucked off. A little bit late. Uh, yeah, unfortunately. So Richards and Taylor both lived to tell their tale, and John Taylor ended up becoming, like I said earlier, the third prophet of the church after Bloody Brigham in Salt Lake City. Okay, now there's obviously, there is so much more to this story that we can really dive into, even in a two-part interview, but there are a couple of questions I wanted to ask you about. Um, first, I did kind of want to go back to the uh, the last words of Joe, because I know that some people have suggested that there's a lot more meaning in his OMG than you would think at first blush. Yes, so he said the phrase, oh Lord my God, which <laughs> doesn't seem like it, it, it means that much. It's the but kind of thing that you would say when you're about to die, yeah. Fair enough, but he's never ever been quoted saying anything like that before. That's not how he prayed. He didn't take the Lord's name in vain. Um, he was, uh, that's just not a phrase that he ever said. However, what we do have is accounts of him saying the rest of the possible phrase of what that is, and it's actually identified as the Masonic cry for help. The entire phrase is, O oh Lord, my God, is there no help for the widow's son? And, and that's supposed to bring all of the, the, 
local masons in the area to the help of whoever made the Masonic cry for help. Right, or tell any masons that happen to be in that mob, hey, I'm a mason, don't shoot me. Exactly, yes, and that's, I think, what he was attempting to do. Gotcha. So the telling sign of this is um, only people that will understand this are people that are current or ex-Mormons, but when they're sustaining somebody or in the church, they raise their hand to the square. The, the church calls this person as, um, do you sustain this person as the prophet of the church or as the president of the uh, mission council or whatever, and then all of the members that are for the motion raise their hand up to the square, which is just holding your elbow at 90 degrees and holding your arm po or your hand pointing straight up. Mm -hmm. Well, this Masonic cry for help has you hold the, both of your arms up to the square, pointing up towards the heavens, and saying this, Oh Lord my God, is there no help for the widow's son? So we have Joe making the motion and saying the first part of the phrase, Oh Lord my God, and we know that him and Hiram Smith were both master masons in good standing at the time of their death. So it's just a blatant like, wink and nod to the fact that, you know, masonry has some sort of foundation in the church because a lot of the members of the church were indeed master masons. And again, I guess that kind of knocks another hole in the whole martyr thing. The last words he's saying is, oh, basically, please don't kill me. <laughs> uh, right. I, I might be right. one of you. Please don't kill me or... Yeah, please, please don't kill me or come help me because I'm getting shot at, please. Yeah, right, yeah. right. No, Not much of a martyr. I, I guess the real obvious question to me here is we're talking about a guy who had, like you said, a standing army that, that damn near rivaled the American regulars at this point. Why weren't they there? That's actually a really good question. We don't know, primarily because Joe had so many fucking enemies. So many people wanted him dead at the time. Now, there's speculations that um, Brigham Young could have been somehow involved. The only thing that we can say to that is the whereabouts of Brigham Young weren't accounted for at the time, nor were, were the whereabouts of Hosea Stout, his right-hand man. So uh, we can kind of speculate and say that maybe there was some connection there. And then we also have the fact that Willard Richards, the only guy that wasn't shot, that return or that ended the entire day completely unscathed was the cousin of Brigham Young and it ended up holding a leadership position in the church. So there's possible ways to say that Brigham Young might have had some sort of connection with it, but we can't say anything definitively, of course, because Brigham Young was really good at covering his own tracks. Right, but this also does fit into his, like, modus operandi quite a bit, you know, what we know of him later in his history with the church. Very much so, and we also know that Samuel Smith, who is Joe and Hiram's younger brother, was the rightful heir to the throne, and Joe had revealed that he would be the successor and the next prophet of the church. Well, Samuel Smith ended up falling ill just after Joe and Hiram had been shot and martyred, well, assassinated, gunfighted, right, whatever, yeah. however you want to call it. And Hosea Stout, this uh, this guy that was right-hand man to Brigham Young, ended up being the house nurse or the guy that was taking care of Samuel Smith. And he was seen taking a white powder into Samuel Smith's bunk through the month uh, leading up to his death. So, Samuel Smith was poisoned for the month following Joe and Hiram's death, and then miraculously, Brigham Young became the second prophet of the church. Does that not seem weird? This is sounding like imperial fucking Rome at this point. All right, so <laughs> now I know that the Mormons try to make this sound more like the end of Braveheart than the end of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, but I, I'm, I'm curious how the real history that you've uncovered up to this point compares to what you were taught as a Mormon growing up in the church. Did they tell you at all about the, the Carthage uh, shootout? Honestly, it doesn't compare at all. I mean, the story that we're told growing up in the church, and even historians today, the, the story that they tell is so watered down and whitewashed compared to what the actual history was. I was never told that Joseph had a gun. Mm -hmm. I was never told that... He gave the Masonic cry for help. I was never told that Willard Richards was never, you know, the only person not shot in the room when he posed the biggest target. I was never told that the people that were possibly motivated to kill him might have been Mormons that just hated him or didn't want him to continue fucking their wives or their daughters. Or, I mean, I wasn't told who was trying to kill him. It was just, well, Joseph was arrested. 
arrested because of persecution against the church mm -hmm. because people didn't think that he was a real prophet. So then he was arrested, and then, then a mob gathered. Then they ran up to his jail cell, and then they shot him, and he fell out of a window. And that was it. That's all I knew. There was no details to it. Even if you go and take the tour of the Carthage jail that's, writ that's run by the church nowadays, they will tell you that the only defense that they had that the men had in the room were the canes that they were using to try and block the the assailants they, they say nothing about the gun even up until this day when it's in their own fucking history they won't talk about it. right right it's buried somewhere in nine volumes of thousands of pages of history but they just don't offer it up you've got to come looking for it exactly and you can confront them with it and they'll own up to it honestly and mm -hmm. say, yes, well, okay, he did have a pistol that was smuggled in, but they they never um, they never reveal it right offhand and come by it honestly. You have to ask. You have to dig. You have to know the reality of the situation before you can investigate what they're actually reporting and the, the veracity of their claims. Yeah, right, because who would think to themselves, well, I, gee shucks, I wonder if he had a gun in that prison. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right, and they actually have the gun in their own museum of the Carthage jail. Really? They, they, they have the gun itself. They have the watch from John Taylor that's uh -huh. frozen at 5.16 p.m. They have all of the artifacts from that day, but they just don't say anything about it. It's just like, here's a pistol. Here's some clothes with some blood stains on them that might have been Joseph's. <laughs> like, that's wow. it. Yeah, no, I guess it, it certainly fucks up the whole martyr, martyr tale. Well, the good news is that the kids that are growing up in the church today Day have an advantage that you don't have. Of course, that's the Naked Mormonism podcast. And it's also worth noting that this is only one of the many fucked up stories in Mormon history, and I would say by no means the most fucked up one. No. So if you'd like to learn more about the various ways that Scientologists ain't got shit on the Mormons, be sure to check out Bryce's show, Naked Mormonism. You'll find that on iTunes, Stitcher, and of course linked in the show notes for this episode. Bryce, thanks again for joining us, man. Absolutely. Thank you for having me.